The early Christian writers had the saying that God wrote two books, the book of the sacred scriptures and the book of nature, or sometimes they called it the book of creation. Well, it's that second book that I want to look at, the book of nature, the book of creation, and explore that and see what it can offer us of insight into who God is and who we are and what this prayer union is between us. What I'm hoping this afternoon to do is to provide you with an abundance of distractions, maybe even a lifetime of distractions. Now, that probably sounds a little strange since all of us here work at contemplative prayer and normally are trying to minimize distraction, gently. Uh, so I'm not talking about distraction in prayer. I'm talking about distraction in the rest of our lives, our everyday lives, routine lives, mundane lives, whatever you want to say. Something that will provide a distraction out of the everydayness and routine and mundaneness and remind us about God, present, loving us, calling us to prayer, union, and love. So that's my hope, to be able to provide some distractions as you go about your daily duties, not for your meditation, okay? Now, where this particular uh, reflection started was last Thanksgiving. And it's going to take a while for me to set the table for where I'm eventually heading here, so I'm asking for your patience. But last Thanksgiving, before the wonderful mass of gratitude that we have on Thanksgiving, I was reflecting on some words for a homily. And I love those words of Dag Hammarskjöld. For all that has been, thanks, to all that will be, yes. So that was a theme running in my mind, and I started to review my life to see what, what did I really want to be thankful to God for? as I came into this particular Thanksgiving. Well, this little voice in my head, idea, whatever, came in and said, Joe, why be so small as to thank God just for your little life? Why don't you get big and thank God for the life of the whole universe? Why don't you really expand and get out there? And so I did. I started to expand my Thanksgiving. Well, if we're going to thank God for the life of the universe, we have to go back quite a ways. Huh? And scientists tell us it's about 13.7 billion years ago that this whole thing got started. And at that point, everything that's in this universe, that we can look out, our whole planet, our sun, stars, galaxies, and so on, all of that was contained in a little speck. So small we can't even imagine it. They call it a singularity. And at that point, 13.7 billion years ago, that speck suddenly began to expand, inflate, they say, and go on expanding into this universe. Now, scientists can measure what happened one trillionth of a second after that Big Bang, they call it. But they don't know why it started to expand then. Or they don't know why it was there in the first place, right? That's outside the scope of their science. But those of us that read the other book, we might remember God saying, let there be light. And there was light. Who knows? There may be that kind of correspondence between our two books at this point. But anyhow, at that point, the universe began to expand. They call it the Big Bang. And as it expanded, this little speck which was infinitely energized and infinitely hot, began to convert some of that energy into matter. We know from Einstein that matter and energy are convertible. So it began to convert some of that energy into matter, and the matter began to form some places more densely, other places less densely. The places that it was more dense were to become the galaxies less dense, the intergalactic space. 
And then in the galaxies themselves, the matter again was arranged some places more densely, some places less densely. And the areas where the matter, which at this point is almost all hydrogen, is which what we got from the Big Bang, 10% uh, helium, what was more dense in this cloud or nebula began to be affected by gravity, the first force going, and it began to pull these atoms together. And the more it pulled them together, the stronger the gravity became and the stronger the pull. And so it pulled and pulled and crushed it together in the center. So what was in the middle of this great push got to be extremely compressed and extremely hot, compression heats. So it got so hot that it formed a thermonuclear fire. There was a blast of radiance and it just blasted out and went across the universe. And that was our first star. And then over and over throughout the different galaxies, these different masses of atoms were coming together and forming these beautiful stars. And we can imagine this. We can't imagine the Big Bang. But we can imagine this because we can look out. And here, some of you perhaps live in cities where you don't see the Milky Way. But here at night, you can see the Milky Way. You see this band of stars. It's like a white cloud. And what the scientists tell us is, just to give us a little sense of size beyond our imagination, there are probably a hundred billion galaxies. And some of these are small and some large, but on average, the galaxy has a hundred billion stars. So we're talking big, okay? Really big. So our notion of God at this point just goes way out, expands. Now, these stars weren't just sitting there looking pretty. They were doing that. They were very pretty. But they were also working. They were doing something very important for us. They were these thermonuclear ovens cooking the elements that came out of the Big Bang so that they went to higher levels of atomic particles. Basically, we started just with hydrogen, the simplest of all atoms. But the hydrogen burned and became helium. And the helium burned and became carbon. Now, let me just warn you, I had a Jesuit classical education. So I have Latin, Greek, French and stuff. I had no science, no, no chemistry, none of this other stuff. So you, you can fill in the, the spaces for me on that, OK? But that's what we're dealing with. These stars are cooking up what was to become the matter for our planet and our body. We don't get calcium from the Big Bang. We don't get carbon from the Big Bang directly. These things had to be made in the stars, in the cooking in the oven and in the explosion I just mentioned. So what would happen is these stars would be cooking down these, these fuels until they got heavier and heavier materials. Well, at some point they got towards iron and it would take more energy to move iron to its next level, then it was going to get back out of it. And so at that point, the radiation dwindles. And the balance that the star had been holding between the outpush of radiation and the inpush of gravity is upset. The outpush of radiation has been limited severely. So gravity sends this whole mass of the star crashing into the center and that causes a giant explosion like the Big Bang. They call it a supernova. And this supernova, for a space of I don't know how many moments, is brighter than all the rest of the stars in the galaxy added together. Extremely bright. So when we look across the universe with our, our big telescopes, we can see supernovas billions of year, light years away. They are so bright. Now. Besides being bright, there's this helpful little point. This explosion has now spread the elements of the star out into a new cloud, a new nebula. So these wonderful elements it's been building are now spread out in a new nebula. And there again, places more dense and less dense, and the more dense places begin collecting to form a new star. And this goes over and over again. As the universe is in a process of making more and more complex 
elements, more and more developed elements. So this is what's happening as the universe is expanding. When the universe gets to about two-thirds of its present age, so about four and a half billion years ago, there was a giant star, and for a supernova you need a big star, bigger than our sun. There was a giant star in our neighborhood of the Milky Way, and that star blew up, sent out its materials in a beautiful supernova. And then again, some of these materials began to collect together and to form another star. And that star was our sun. So finally, we're coming into the picture a little closer. Huh? Our sun was formed four and a half billion years ago. And 99.9% .9 of that cloud that formed the sun went directly into the sun. About 0.01% was left over and formed a dish spinning around the sun. This was going to become the planets. So this is our beginning, four and a half billion years ago. So if God was impatient with my Thanksgiving getting there, we're starting to get closer, you know? Here we come. So at this point, this dish, the asteroids, whatever, the little pieces of material begin banging into each other, adhering to each other, getting bigger and then forming actually enough matter to form its own gravity field, pulling more stuff in, and as it spun around, it cleared out its area and brought all that material into the sphere of the planet. That's what Earth did. Now at this point, the Earth is, is going through all these collisions, which is making it up. It is so hot that it is a molten sphere. It, it doesn't have a surface. It, it is just hot liquid molten rock. It took a half a billion years to just begin to form a crust. Okay? So after half a billion years we have a crust forming. In about another half a billion years some of these elements got together in such a way that they formed a living organism. A simple celled living organism. Prokaryote is a name. Really bacteria. That's about the first thing that gets going. And it can uh, have a metabolism and it can replicate itself so that it fits our definition of living. Uh, it's not a high form of life, but there it was. And it's on the earth for about another half a billion years. And then something happens that uh, is really extraordinary. And it, it just put a rocket into this evolutionary process. And it's called photosynthesis. But I want to talk about photosynthesis by itself after a bit. So I'm going to leave that piece of the process alone. So let's just say that here is the Earth. Life is forming and evolving. And as it evolves, it gets more complex, more developed. You begin to get grass, trees, plants, flowers, animals, fish, on and on. Even, finally, dinosaurs. Great big dinosaurs running around on planet Earth here. Now, the development wasn't a smooth, steady progression. It had its bumps and lumps and its ups and downs, uh, somewhat like our lives. And actually, these are important to us. In particular, one bump was very important to us. 65 million years ago, an asteroid about 10 miles across, which is a big asteroid, came plowing into planet Earth around the Yucatan Peninsula and sent up such a cloud of debris that it darkened the whole planet for quite a while. And with that, vegetation began to die. Everything needs the sunlight and it wasn't getting the sunlight. But among the things that died were the dinosaurs. And that's really important for us. Scientists speculate that probably if this extinction of the dinosaurs hadn't happened, we wouldn't have happened. I mean, mammals were just no competition for the dinosaurs. Uh, it was like being in Jurassic Park without a weapon. We were just dinosaur food. But with this, with this uh, tremendous collision of the asteroid and the darkness and the extinction of the dinosaurs, one little mammal, a tree shrew, survived it. It survived the Tyrannosaurus rex, and somehow it survived during the dark period. And it was able then 
to pick up and get going as life restored on the planet. And out of that one thing, all that we know of as mammals came. Fish were doing all right. There was some extinction there, but mammals, everything on the surface got kind of wiped out. The mammals grew back and we began to get the different animals that we are used to. And finally, maybe four million years ago, we got an animal that looked sort of like a human. We called it a humanoid. It wasn't quite human yet, it wasn't Homo sapiens, but it was getting closer. This development in evolution, in creation, towards the human was moving along. Finally, just about 150,000 years ago. So in, in terms of the times we're talking about, not even the blink of an eye, 150,000 years, we, heck, we can imagine that. 150,000 years ago, we had something on this planet that was us, Homo sapiens. And somehow, and we don't know the how that this came about, but somehow this evolved Homo sapiens was blessed by God with intelligence, consciousness, awareness, self-awareness, and freedom. So it's like a new being on this planet. And with that, with that self-awareness, with that freedom, it could choose to love. It could choose to love its creator. So finally, if we're reading the mind of God right in this book, and God has put this all in place as a beautiful thing, but with the hope of having some piece of creation able to love God back in a way that a person can love. Probably the trees are loving God and the rocks are loving God and all that. But the way a person loves with knowing and free choice, finally it has happened in Homo sapiens. Now, some of us Homo sapiens evidently aren't even interested and don't ask where we came from or where we're going and just plow along. Others, others can just be overwhelmed by the sense of having been brought into being out of nothing. And here we are. And might break into song. How great thou art. You know, and have a, a very songful liturgy or whatever else. And then others of us as we look at this mystery of being and being brought into being, we get brought into silence, get brought down into the core of this self-awareness that we're gifted with and this freedom and to go into a silent communion with the Creator who not who didn't create this world way back there and left it, but is constantly creating and constantly holding everything that is in being and without this God holding it and being, it ceases to be. So, so this whole thing is vibrant with God and we in our silence then can simply be in that presence, surrendered to that presence, surrendered to the activity of God in us. You might remember some of these words from your initial training. Surrender to the presence and surrender to the activity of God in us. So here we are. That's our response. We can also sing hymns if we want. That's fine. But that's our response to be able to be totally overwhelmed in awe, silent, and adoring that presence that is holding us up at this very second. And not only holding us up, but inviting us into a conscious union. Okay? Okay? That's chapter one. We have 14 chapters. <laughs> so, chapter two, I want to take this further because God wanted to take it further. We have the mystery of God not being satisfied with the degree of love and union that was floating back and forth at this point, but wanting to come down and actually become one of us. Be right in our world where he could talk to us in human language, walk with us, show us how we might live by living it himself. The mystery of incarnation. Huh? That incredible gift that God chose not to simply be the almighty being who creates and holds it in being, 
but chooses to come down and be friend, be in love with us in a human way. So I want to take a look at this, and I want to stay within the categories I've been opening out so we haven't wasted all that other stuff. And just look at this mystery of incarnation. And literally there are libraries written on the topic. So I'm going to take this one little sliver. A phrase or a couple of phrases that we use during the Christmas liturgies about Christ and the incarnation is Christ is the radiant one. Christ is the radiant dawn. It's one of the O antiphons, O radiant dawn. Christ is the bright morning star or the bright day star. Incredible, when I think of it, because that title goes back quite a ways. I couldn't quite get to the origin of it. It goes quite a ways. When did those people get the idea that the sun was a star, like those other little dots of light in the sky? It seemed to me that was pretty advanced astronomy to realize our sun is just another star. But at any rate, they're calling Christ the day star, the bright sun. Now, what, what's happening when they use this radiant dawn, bright day star, is they're getting us into a metaphor or an analogy. And the metaphor is saying something like, whatever the sun is for the earth, that tells us something about what Christ is for us. So that's the metaphor we're working with. Whatever the sun is for the earth, Christ is for us. So let's go take a look at the sun for a moment. As I said before, that's our star out there. Well, the sun provides everything for the earth. Huh? First of all, the sun keeps us here. By its incredible gravity, it holds us in orbit. Without the gravity of the sun, we'd go flying out into interstellar space and be a frozen rock out there someplace. But the sun's gravity holds us in orbit. Beyond that, the sun casts its light on us and its warmth. And ultimately, through that warmth and light, it casts life on this planet. So all of it is coming from the sun. We're getting an idea of what the sun is. Now, the sun, in order to do that, in order to send out this radiance, this light, this warmth, and ultimately this life, the sun is burning up four million tons of its substance every second. Can you imagine that? Four million tons a second of the sun is being burned up to send out this light. Well, the sun is big, so it can go for another five billion years, they figure. You don't have to start worrying. But this is the self-giving of the sun. Four billion tons a second in order to send out this radiance. And this radiance is going out in every direction, right? It's a sphere. So every direction around it, this radiance is going out. And we're here, a tiny dot, 93 million miles away from the sun, catching, you know, the tiniest percentage. I wouldn't even have the math to be able to figure how tiny a percentage of the sun's radiance we're actually capturing here and using. But that is enough for us. It gives us all the light and all the warmth that we need. So that gives you an idea of what the sun is for us. It's this incredible source of everything. We're just nowhere without it, okay? That's easy to see. Now, this part is a little more interesting, perhaps. The earth gives something back to the sun. Can you imagine? Well, what? The earth shows forth the sun's power, its beauty, and its radiance. Now just think about that for a second. The sun's radiance is going out in every direction. Essentially, without the earth here, and, and I'll include the other planets, that radiance is just heading out into interstellar space, dissipated, never ever showing up as light, or as warmth, or as anything. It's invisible. You know, when we go out at night, during the day we can't do this because our atmosphere is all lit up by the sun. But at night, when the atmosphere isn't lit up by the sun, we see trillions of miles into space. See these little stars out there. Two, what? 
maybe even 3,000 light years away, trillions and trillions of miles. We're looking through the sun's radiance. We're looking through the sun's rays to do that. You know, and we don't see the sun's rays and the sun's rays don't block us seeing. We see right through it. It's nothing. Unless we look and see the moon. And there's this beautiful moon there. And it's gorgeous, right? Who doesn't stand in awe when they see a bright moon, full moon, quarter moon, whatever. So we see the moon, and the moon is bright because the sun is shining on it. It has no brightness of its own. Actually, they say it's even a pretty dark rock on its own. But the sun shining on it gives us this incredibly beautiful thing in the sky. Well, if that's true for the moon, and true for the other planets, we see Mercury, Jupiter, Venus, you know, beautiful. I'm biased, but nothing matches the Earth in terms of showing forth the sun's beauty. The Earth is clearly the most beautiful planet. We have blue oceans covering about 70, 75% of the surface. So we call it the blue planet. And we're the first people, this generation, we've actually seen pictures of the Earth from outer space. Nobody ever did that before. So we now get a God's eye view of this Earth, or a sun's eye view, you might say. And we see the beautiful blue. We see the, the tan of the Sahara Desert and some of the other deserts. We see the dark green of the jungles and the forests. Or the gray of the mountain ranges and the white of the clouds. It's gorgeous, this planet. It's truly gorgeous. And as such, it is showing what the sun is. It is showing forth the power, the radiance, the beauty of the sun, this, this little gem. And if we were to follow it in, these sun's rays as they were coming, just to fill out our metaphor a tiny bit, follow it in closer from this picture than in outer space and come into one of these mountain valleys right up here, even right now, the end of July, you have beautiful green meadows filled with all sorts of mountain wildflowers. Every color, shape, whatever. Just a gorgeous scene. You see it on calendars. It's one incredible sight. All of that is there and showing up because of the sun. So without the sun lighting it, nobody would see it. But that's not the whole story. Without the sun causing the heat that caused the prokaryotes, that caused the development of life, there would be no flowers. We just have a barren planet. The sun has caused all of this. So what we do then, what our role is, we are like the manifestation that says, sun, you're beautiful. Here, look, here you are, okay? So that's our role. Now, what I've been trying to do in prose, uh, a lady did in poetry, much better than anything I could do. And uh, I'm going to read it. It's a short enough poem, and I abridged it a bit more. The lady's name is Patty Ann Rogers. And the name of the poem is The Significance of Location. The cat has the chance to make the sunlight beautiful, to stop it and turn it immediately into black fur and motion, to take it as shifting branch and brown feather into the back of the brain forever. The cardinal has flown the sun in red through the oak forest to the lawn. The finch has caught it in yellow and taken it among the thorns. By the spider, it has been bound tightly and tied in an eight-string knot. The sun has been intercepted in its one basic state and changed to a million varieties of green stick and tassel. It has been broken into pieces by glass rings, by mist over the river. Imagine the sun totally isolated, its brightness shot in continuous streaks straight out into the black, never arrested never once being made light. Someone should take note of how the earth has saved the sun from oblivion. So That's the sun and the earth. So now, to look at the other half of that metaphor then, uh, Christ and us, you have the picture. Christ is to us what the sun is to the earth. And the sun is everything. It radiates the warmth, the light, the life, and all. Christ is radiating that for us. Now, it's a metaphor. Christ isn't radiating physical light. 
The sun does the photons and all that stuff. Christ is radiating God life. That's what Christ is up to. Radiating God life to us. So, what is God life? As we read the Gospels, look at Christ's life, look at the parables, we say, God's life is love, compassion, caring, forgiving, reaching out, giving itself away. Christ giving himself away in the passion, death, resurrection. We talked about the sun giving itself away four million tons a second. Christ giving himself away is more than that. Giving himself away. So that is the God life Christ radiates out to us. It's our role then as planet Earth, right, to be here and stop those rays from just going flying by, as it were, to catch that radiance of God's life, to absorb it, to take it in and let it change and transform us and then to reflect it out so that we are reflections of the Christ. Now, each of us does that in a unique way. Each of us has our own shape, our own situation, our own circumstances, so that this radiance from Christ hits us and is absorbed by us, transforming us, and comes back out looking different in each person. Uh, to me, the image that I carry, and, and actually the image for this whole talk, to be honest about my mind here, is that mountain meadow with all the beautiful flowers, each of its own color, even some of the same species coming out in different colors. That's us taking in and reflecting the life that Christ radiates to us, absorbing that radiation, being transformed by it, and sending it back out. Now, that's the similarity in the metaphor. So metaphors have a thing that is similar, and sometimes they have a thing that is different. So there's a difference that we have to acknowledge here. In the first part of the metaphor, with the sun and the earth, the earth cannot not reflect the sun. It's the very nature of anything made of atoms, what's called baryonic material. It's the very nature of it to interact with the electromagnetic force and in the visible range to reflect color. It's just, it can't do anything different. That's it. It's going to do that. It's not so for us. We have that thing we spoke about earlier called freedom. We have the ability to reflect, be self-aware, and then to choose and to freely choose. So we have the possibility of either saying, yes, I'm going to take in, receive, be receptive to this radiance of Christ and let it transform me and transform my action, or to say, no, I'm going to let it go by me, pass right on by. You know, in the uh, material world, one of the things scientists are scratching their heads over, actually for the past couple decades, is something they call dark matter. We didn't know about this. Three decades back, we didn't know about this. But it seems as if in our universe, beyond all the light matter, everything we can see and deal with, all the stars, galaxies, planets, and whatnot, there is another matter. This matter has nothing to do with light. It doesn't react to light. It doesn't show light, doesn't absorb it, doesn't do anything with it. And it seems it lets it come right through it. And this matter, the scientists say, actually is probably four, five, or six times more prevalent than light matter. So it's much more abundant than light matter. It holds our galaxies together. That's how they figure out it's there, because you can't see it. But it affects gravity. And it holds the galaxies together. It sets the speed that galaxies are going to spin and so on. And it's, it's a big challenge. So they're going to figure that out. And you'll see it in the headlines someday. But for the moment, it's sitting there, dark matter. And what it amounts to is we have the choice. If we want, we can be dark matter. We can just let this grace of Christ, the radiance of Christ, go right by us. Or we can choose to respond. Now, I'm presenting it like black and white, all or nothing. Of course, life isn't black or white, all or nothing. I would believe that we are all someplace in between on this scale. I wouldn't think any one of us or anyone on this planet is dark matter entirely. 
that there's anyone who doesn't reflect some of God, some of God's goodness, graciousness, compassion, and so on. At the same time, and I may be wrong here, but I don't think there's anyone that so perfectly reflects it that they can't grow in it and become a better reflection of Christ, of that love, compassion, self-giving, forgiveness, and so on. So that's, that brings us again back to that same issue of receptivity. That's, that's what I'm seeing here, is the aspect of opening ourselves out, choosing freely to open ourselves out, to be receptive of this radiance of Christ, to let it come in, to let it change us, transform us, and then be reflected out in our actions and behaviors. So, one of the elements, to say the least, one of the elements at I see in contemplative prayer is the development of this receptive capacity, the element of being open to the radiance and letting it come in, getting rid of as many of the obstacles to it as possible, as much of the dark matter as possible that lets it just float by us without any effect. So that would be my sense then of the incarnation in this image of Christ as the radiant one. Christ as being God's life radiating to us and us being like the earth, like a mountain valley, reflecting back that, that glory, love, forgiveness, compassion, and so on to God. So that's, that's our incarnational dimension here. Now, I want to take this one step further in this sense. I want to look at receptivity and sunlight under a particular heading. And I think it gives us an interesting analogy. It's going to be shorter. I mentioned earlier the process of photosynthesis. So I'm coming back to that now. Again, I have no training in science, okay? But I will try and describe photosynthesis so you have a, a, at least a notion of what's in my mind. And I will do it anthropomorphically because I can't do it scientifically. So what's happening is I mentioned here's planet Earth, half a billion years just to cool down and get a crust, another half a billion years to get these little prokaryotes running around or crawling around, whatever they were doing. And then in another half billion years about this photosynthesis coming in and it changes something. Up till then, the sun was causing life in these prokaryotes just by its light, by its warmth. But the sun has a lot more potential than that, which wasn't being realized. And then at this point in time at photosynthesis, something got realized. And I said, I'll anthropomorphically will say, this cell chlorophyll figured something out. It figured out how if it held carbon dioxide and water up to the sun's rays, the sun's rays would transform that carbon dioxide and water into oxygen and sugar. That's essentially photosynthesis. Now, what's happening here and why it was such a giant change is the oxygen and sugar that are produced out of this transformation are essential for our kind of life. You can't have animals running around, much less humans, without oxygen to burn. We don't run like the prokaryotes in a carbon dioxide atmosphere. We need the more powerful oxygen, more flammable actually oxygen, in order for our muscles to burn and do their thing. And also, Believe it or not, we need calories. Most of us are on a campaign of trying to hold them back. But without calories, there's no energy in the system. So we need calories. So we need the sugar that this process began to put on the planet. Then it produced one form of sugar. Somebody eats that and it produces another form. It goes on and on. But we needed this. So this process wasn't just an interesting change. It was totally essential to get us to where we are now. Without that, we wouldn't be here. We, were, we required that 
in order, in order to be here. Now, there's another feature here, if I go back on this just a little bit to keep in mind. The carbon dioxide that's being transformed into oxygen and sugar of itself isn't that harmful. We, we exhale carbon dioxide, but this is small quantities. In a large enough quantity, carbon dioxide is poisonous for us because we need the oxygen. So enough carbon dioxide and we suffocate and die. Simple as that. So in this sense, carbon dioxide is toxic for us. And what happens in this process then is not just that two elements are transformed into two other elements, but one of these elements, carbon dioxide, is harmful to us, is toxic, and it's getting transformed into something that is absolutely essential for us. So it's an incredible process. What was harmful in its first state becomes useful in the second state. Okay? Now... Where did I want to go with that? <laughs> I left water out of the equation, partly because I was just interested in the toxic value of carbon dioxide. So I'll let your imaginations deal with water. In, in many cultures, water is cleansing and purification. In St. John's Gospel, water is the Holy Spirit. In other scriptures, water is the sacraments, baptism especially. So it's all of that. You can hold that. The thing I'm most interested in is this dimension of the toxic being changed into the beneficial. Now, where this comes into play in my imagination regarding contemplative prayer is this. In contemplative prayer, we have this thing called the unloading of the unconscious. I don't think I have to explain that any further, okay? <laughs> So toxic things come up. What do we do with the toxic elements that come up? What happens with that? Huh? And what I'm getting out of this process, judge for yourselves whether there's a truth to it or not, what this process says to me is if we can just hold the toxic elements up to the radiance of Christ, the sunlight, the rays of Christ, those toxic elements are transformed. Right? Now, keep in mind, they're not just taken away. It would be darn nice if they're just taken away. I think any of us would be satisfied with that. You know, take it away. But that's not what happens. They're not just taken away. They're transformed into something beneficial for us. Now, from experience I say that's not always obvious firsthand. But as we get to look back, we begin to see that. That what was toxic once has been transformed by the radiance of Christ, taken into contemplative prayer. And then it becomes beneficial in our lives. It becomes useful when we talk to other people. It becomes all sorts of richness that we can't even imagine when we're dealing with it. Now, there's a second piece we can get from this metaphor. It's this. As I mentioned a moment ago, for about a billion and a half years, the sun is shining on planet Earth. It has all this richness of potential to be life-giving in many ways, but planet Earth can only take it in as light and warmth at this stage, for a billion and a half years. It's only when chlorophyll comes along and figures out how it can hold the carbon dioxide and water up to the sun and create all these wonderful things like oxygen and sugar, that the sun's help to the earth just multiplies exponentially. And the sun is able to create a marvel of evolution that, that we sit here witnessing to. So just think about that then. Those, those billion and a half years where the sun's rays were not utilized, maybe wasted in, in, in one form. And then they became utilized and we have this proliferation of all this growth and wonderful stuff, including us. Then think, here was God's love, God's compassion, God's caring, God's forgiving, God's giving himself away, shining on planet Earth, billions of years. 
And really, it was only when Christ came that someone was able to get it fully. Now, there were people before Christ who lived holy lives and could catch uh, some, some dimension of this from God. So I'm not saying nothing happened. But it was only with Christ that someone could fully get this love dimension, radiance, compassion of God. And take that in and reflect it back out to us in the way we get it. So I find that interesting, a little bit like... The we can also go and look at our own lives. Again, that love, compassion, forgiveness, reaching out to us of God was going on from the first moment of our creation. And yet, really it's only little by little that we become receptive to it. That we take on the ability to take it in, to really get it. How much God loves us. How much He cares. And let that be transformative in our own lives. So, uh, just those other reflections, how photosynthesis might be like this or like that in us. But especially, I, I'm, uh, I'm entranced with the idea that it, it's like the unloading of the unconscious, that it, it can take the toxic elements out and give that love and radiance of God within. So, that's, that's the image of photosynthesis. And now the final one in our science class today. is morphogenic fields. So up to now I've been dealing with basically the visible universe other than dark matter which snuck in there but basically the physical universe. Morphogenic fields brings us into uh, a different dimension of the universe an invisible dimension of the universe. Probably many of you have heard it but uh, I want to share just some aspects of it. The uh, fellow that's been doing most of the work on this to get started is Rupert Sheldrake, a biologist in Britain, I think at Cambridge. And according to him, he maintains that the morphogenic field carries a resonance that allows experiences of the past to transfer patterns and learning to ongoing generations. I'm not going to repeat that because you don't need it. Okay. Uh, and I'm not even going to try and define it further because the definitions get more vague than the reality. The examples will be clear. And it, the thing is fascinating. Uh, and it's, it's real. It's being studied in many ways today, medicinally and so on. What it comes down to, uh, to start with, I think, what is the first test that was hinting at this, was Pavlov, the Russian scientist. We know him from dogs with saliva. Here we have rats, so we've, we've moved to rats. And he had this experiment going where he had a bunch of rats and he was trying to train them to go to a feeder when he rang the bell. Okay. It took him 300 times of ringing the bell before all of the rats went to the feeder. So he accomplished that. Now, happily rats reproduce rather fast, so you can go generations in a hurry. The next generation following this one who had not seen their parents or learned from them or had any kind of physical communication from them were put in the same experiment. And after ringing the bell a hundred times, all of these rats were at the feeder. You know, how he explained that? Well, he kept pushing it. And uh, so many times down the run, he just had to ring it 30 times and a new batch could run right to the feeder. So where are they getting this information from? Huh? Rupert Sheldrake and others now will be saying there's a morphogenic field where information is stored that passes on to the next generation, making things easier for that generation than it was for the previous generation. Now, I haven't seen this in writing, so I'm making this one up, but it sounds good to me, okay? Uh, I think that learning technology is something of that sort. My generation, okay, as a little kid in the Bronx, when I was first on this block, there were no telephones and certainly no television. So then you get the first party line comes in, you have this wonder, and then the first little television about that big comes on. 
And bit by bit, technology is starting to multiply, okay? And we had to hack our way through it because we weren't trained in it. We didn't have, I would say now, a morphogenic field making this easy. We had to just work through it. And we haven't totally succeeded, is the truth. Uh, if somebody gives us a fancy electronic gift at Christmas, an alarm clock that not only tells the time, wakes us up, starts the coffee, the music, and a few other things, we don't know what to do with it. And we get a 10-year-old kid in there, and he can explain everything, and he doesn't need to look at directions. He just picks it up, and it's there. So I maintain this is the morphogenic field in action. It, it can uh, just, it, it, it just communicates that. So these kids get it, you know? It's not fair in a way, but there it is. They get it, but luckily they do help us and tell us how to record a program when we're not watching it and we're out someplace. It'll record a program on our VCR or whatever. VCRs are finished too. But at any rate, that, that's, the, that's what we're talking about. Morphogenic fields. To go back to animals for a second, I want to bring up one other factor contained in this. I think many of you would have heard the story of the hundredth monkey. Is that right? Does everybody know it or should I repeat it? Okay, we'll, we'll repeat it. Um, I believe this is an, exper it's an experiment. I believe it was taking place after World War II on the island of Ajima, off the coast of Japan. And I'm not even clear what the nature of the experiment was. But what happened in the course of it, it was with monkeys. One little monkey got the sweet potato it was being fed and didn't like the fact that it was all sandy and walked down to the water and washed it off first and then ate it. Well, some other monkeys saw that. So the next day, several monkeys are grabbing their sweet potatoes and walking down to the water and washing them. And then, this is, this is spreading, okay? Not morphogenic field yet, because they're just visually seeing this and they're copying an action that's in front of them. But the reason that the name 100th monkey is said, not that they're counting down to 100, but at some point is maintained that there is a tipping point. A critical mass is reached called the hundredth monkey. And when that tipping point or critical mass is reached, something outstanding happened that nobody expected. And what happened was monkeys on another island and monkeys on the mainland who had no physical contact, no visual contact, started going down and washing off sweet potatoes. So what's that about? It seems as if when enough monkeys had learned it and, as it were, put it into the morphogenic field, that morphogenic field was available then to monkeydom. And washing off sweet potatoes became the in thing. So that's the tipping point or critical mass I want to take out of that story. One last example. This took place in 1993 in Washington, D.C. And there was a group working with violent crime, trying to reduce violent crime. And they were working, I don't think they use the word morphogenic field, but they're working with spiritual energy. How can we use spiritual energy to, in some way, affect physical behavior? And Washington, D.C. is high on the list of violent crime. So what they did is they brought in 4,000 meditators from 60 different countries with the idea they would meditate twice a day trying to somehow reduce the violent crime in the city. They meditated from June 7th to July 31st, so a little less than two months. In that space of two months, violent crime went down by 25%. No other reason could be found. No, science is looking at it, can't find any other reason that would have produced this. The chief of police, when he heard the experiment was going to take place, said the only thing that would reduce violent crime by that much in Washington, D.C. would be a two-foot snowstorm. Well, the meditators didn't get a two-foot snowstorm, but they got the reduction in violent crime. They had to go home to their 60 different countries and whatever happened, happened. But they did this this one time. So this is the kind of thing we're talking about. An invisible field out there that affects oncome, ongoing generations, making some things easier. I would believe in this case the meditators opened out possibilities for these people that do violent crime to have other alternatives, to do other things that wouldn't have occurred to them. 
that, that field opened out and they could do different things. So I just want to make two points from this and then we're there. The first is, I believe that no person more powerful than Jesus Christ has existed on this planet and that he himself has set up a morphogenic field. That just by living at the level he lived, he made available to us coming after him the possibilities of living beyond our normal life. It made it easier for us to follow that path. So that's the first point, that if we could be receptive, this is the receptivity side again, that's been my word over and over, you may have noticed. If we can be receptive to that morphogenic field of Jesus Christ, we have the potential of taking on the mind and the heart of Christ. Huh? The very goal, open mind, open heart, and take on the mind and the heart of Christ. So it's out there for us. That's what I'm saying. It's out there for us. Receptivity on our part is, is the practice. The second thing is this. It encourages me to think that in contemplative prayer, we are helping the world in many different ways that may not be obvious. And the way I'm saying right now is that thing about the tipping point, the critical mass for the hundredth monkey, you know, whatever that was, that by us engaging in the receptivity of that prayer and the transformation of that prayer, we are making it easier for other people to move into that same realm of transformation. It's a contribution we can be making, not aware of it, and maybe we shouldn't even be aware of it. But truth is, I do like to think about it once in a while because it gives me a little moral push and, and a support. But the idea that our lives can carry a helpful, uh, helpful presence to other people, totally unseen, unaware, hopping from island to mainland and all over the place, not limited by physical, and making it a place where that life of Christ is more lived. So that, that's what I'm thinking of. So when I mentioned at the beginning to give you some distractions, I hope I've given you some distractions. Huh? <laughs> I hope when you go out tonight and see stars right across there, you think something about the Creator with the stars. And the creation is just going on. You know, When I was a kid, I used to think creation happened back there. We're in the middle of it. And it's just going on, and here it is. And when you see these trees, there's photosynthesis going right there with the trees and the grass and everything. So I just hope you look around and do this and, and just say, wow, you know, there it is. So, But don't carry it into your meditation. <laughs> okay, Empty. Meditation is empty. There we are. Let me just say, because I have to have a certain degree of integrity here, um, some of this stuff I got from other people. And one is that the section around uh, the sun and the earth, including that poem, came from a Dominican sister, Margaret Galliardi, who I met at our monastery of Trappistines in California. And uh, so she had, uh, she's where I got that piece from. And the second two pieces, photosynthesis and morphogenesis, come from uh, the book Radical Amazement by Judy Canaro. Uh, and so a lot of the ideas are right there in her. So you'll say, oh, that's where we got that. So uh, if you want, the, the book is a, a fun read and can be helpful. But I need to acknowledge that because I didn't think this stuff up. Okay? <laughs> anyway.